Her son remained calm as the judge read the sentence, death by execution. Josue Flores was murdered last Tuesday on his way home from school. I had a nightmare the other night. It was so real. You just thought the world would be dead. I told him I was crazy. Officers tell us Trujillo stabbed her boyfriend with stiletto heel shoes. Police say the suspect may be responsible for the murders of at least six women whose bodies have been found in or near the Acres Homes area. Defense attorneys had argued that Yates was legally insane and grossly psychotic when she drowned the children. One by one, they described the deaths of the alleged other eight victims of the convicted rail car killer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Evidence Room. This is our third episode, and today we're talking about pickaxe killer Carla Faye Tucker. We're also joined by a special guest, J.C. Mosier. You and I have known each other a very long time. Yeah. J.C. is a retired Houston homicide detective, and he's now a sergeant with the Precinct 1 Constable's Office. And this case was, was pretty gruesome. This was 1983. I saw them pictures. I, I tell you, it seemed like it could have been done later. The it was really unbelievable. It was, it was, I'd never seen anything that terrible, and I'd, I worked at Homicide Division about seven, eight years and saw a lot of evil things being done, but never anything quite like this. So you've got Carla Faye Tucker, and I guess what, you called her boyfriend, Danny Garrett at the time? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, goes yeah, over they to were going together. Jeff, Jeffrey Dean's apartment to what, why? They were mad at, at uh, him for something he had done, either something he had said about them or something that they, he had done to them. And when, uh, as Carla told me, she got so messed up on drugs that night, she just said, I'm gonna go over there and kick his ass. When they got in, they did not realize that there was also a young lady who he had brought home that night to his apartment. That's Deborah Thornton? Uh, yes, Deborah Thornton. Was both of them people asleep when y'all went in there? Did you wake him up or? Or did you just wake up? The guy woke up, the girl started waking up. I told her to stick her head under the cover. And she did. Of course, they rousted them out of bed. And of course, the girl's screaming and pleading for her life. And both of them are. Carla just went crazy. I mean, she just went crazy. saw this pickaxe that he used in his business. He was a, he, he dug, he was a cable dug, installer, wasn't he? He dug yeah. uh, phone lines and things, uh, yeah. something like that. But he had this big pickaxe laying right there by his bed. It was a freak thing, man. Yeah. Did y'all take that axe over there? Yeah. It was already there. Yeah. Sitting right beside him. In the archives, the, where all the trial exhibits are, what we're calling the evidence room, the pickaxe is still there. I picked it up. That thing is not a light it's tool. Not. Carla Fay couldn't have weighed more than a buck twenty. She didn't, but I'm going to tell you something. The first thing I heard about Carla from her sister was, JC, do not try to fight with her. She can kick any guy's ass and has done it. Wow, yeah, because when you pick that thing up, that thing is heavy. Yeah, and yeah. then when you look that both Jeffrey and Deborah were hit multiple times with oh, that yeah. pickaxe, oh, I, 
I can't even imagine yeah, the she rage. Finally, she ran out of gas finally. She just she couldn't go any further. Or she would have kept going, but she just finally ran out of gas. You, the, when you talk about evil things that you've seen, I, I looked at the pictures and the actual CSU video was is still there. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. The amount, I mean, that's pure rage. Yeah, she would, I mean, that's how, that's how actually crazy Carla had become. Was it the drugs? Drugs mostly, yeah. She was big into drugs. What did she have? Showing fingerprints? No. No, I just, I seen it in a picture. It had tape on it. I didn't know if they'd stick to tape or not. Tape yeah. won't stick to tape. We had gloves on It's all done. I just tell you the truth, I wish it never would have happened. Before, though, you said this wasn't your case. You weren't assigned to it, but you wound up getting knee-deep into the case. How did that happen? One of the guys working the case came over and said, hey, we talked to a friend of yours today. And I mean, I know what case they're working, so I'm thinking, what? The? I said, what are you, who are you talking about? Well, uh, Danny Garrett. He said he was a friend of yours. And I said, yeah, Danny Garrett. Hell, he's my bartender. I, he's a... He's a real good friend of mine. Yeah, he's a real good guy. I said, what are y'all talking to him for? Said, well, he may have some information about uh, the case, and, and he's got a brother that also was uh, uh, hanging around Carla a lot and this and that. And I knew his brother. Uh, I knew his brother, Doug. Doug was an ex-motorcycle bandito biker. And I knew him for a while before through Danny's wife, who was the girl that grew up in my neighborhood with me. He called me and he said, yeah, JC, they, they came over and woke us up after the, they had done all this stuff. This is the us. brother? Mm-hmm. The brother. Wait, wait. So, Doug. So, say they, so the brother said Carla and Danny came over came after the afterwards, murders? Right afterwards. Had all the stolen stuff that they stole, some of the parts and things that were there, and told them what happened. They can't leave nothing with nothing. No fingerprints. Unless somebody freaks out. They told me that... Uh, they told me in these words, y'all are targets. Oh, yeah, they, told they told us that. How did you get a brother to wear a wire on his brother? I asked that very question. Are you sure you want to do this to, uh, to Danny? He said, JC, they will come kill us now. Wow. And I have to. There's one part in there, though, that, I mean, to this day makes me squirm. She said that she basically achieved an orgasm every time she swung the pickaxe and she, landed she it. She told me that. Do you believe that? She told me that. I asked her that same question. Carla? Yeah. Maybe me telling you that every stroke was that, did you? Did you really? Oh, hell yeah. Well, and I, I told her I didn't believe it. And she's still stuck with that? Uh, yeah. They went in, sat in there for an hour and a half, what, I don't know how long it was, and we were listening on the outside in a big hidden van, uh, and we listened to everything that was said. I love you. I love you too, Dave. I told him, I said, I'm arresting him. Y'all can have the rest of them. Why? Because I wanted to. Uh, did he say anything to you when you're putting the cuffs on He him? sure did. He said, JC, 
I cannot, as, as good of friends as we've been, I cannot believe you could think I'm capable of doing something like that. And I said, well, I guess we'll see what happens. To me, it's, it's, it's like the work of the devil. It's just like the work of the devil. I don't believe I would have ever done anything like that. But when you see those pictures and when you see those bodies, that, that is, is unbelievable. Now, they were both convicted, they were both sentenced to die, but Danny died in jail, right? They were saying liver failure or something. One of the things that was still in the exhibit archive were their letters to each other, Carla yeah. and Danny's letters yeah. to each other. To my darling wife, Carla, may you have a good Valentine's Day. My only wish is that we could be together now and always. I truly believe we will be with each other in the same home again one day whenever it may be. Please be strong and don't let them give you the death sentence. It seems like these were two individuals who were completely divorced from reality. From the, uh, and you know, just going with us. There was nothing in this case that wasn't bizarre. You could stack up the report, which is about that high, and on every page you're gonna go, oh, you know, something weird here, you know what I mean? It's the most bizarre thing I've ever been around in my life. Carla Faye Tucker says religion has prepared her to meet her fate. No matter what I'm going through right now, I know that the Lord is with me and I'm in his presence. So she's on death row now and it's, it's coming up on the execution. Again, only the second woman ever executed in the state of Texas. Last one was during the Civil War. Yeah. I knew that I needed to ask for forgiveness. I don't know how I knew that. I just knew that I had to cry out to God, let him know that what I'd done was horrible and that I needed forgiveness. I invite them to look at the crime scene photos. Let's see how cute they think those are, because the same person who looks out from that television set with those eyes at them is the same person who looks straight at my wife and threw a pickaxe into her body. It's hard to explain how you feel when you know you're sending somebody to death. And I think I had about 14 in my career. Uh, no other women, though. She would send me a card from time to time, and, and I, would, I would send back a response from time to time. And uh, What would she send you? I mean, what was she writing to you? It would be like uh, Christmas. And, you know, just a, a, it'd be some time of the year that was a, an event or something. Happy Easter, happy, you know. Carla knitted me a beautiful sweater on death row. Even the label, she had her own labels, uh, made with tender loving care by Carla Faye Tucker. I've never worn it, I wouldn't dare wear it. I just put it away. In 1983, Tucker says her heart was changed. That's when she says she accepted Christ. I don't care how bad it is what you've done. God will meet you right where you're at. And I tell you, I think that her transition to the love of God was real. Most people tell me, J.C., you're an idiot. That's just a show up there. And, and I, 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 just, I just think, I think back to her, to her start in life, how terrible it was. All the terrible things that happened to those two girls, Carla and Carrie, they just, they just almost never had a chance. I mean, they never had a chance like you and I did. They were uh, turned into prostitutes at a young age and were actually working right out of their home. Her mother was a, a prostitute in her younger days. I do feel sorry for her, not for her crime. I feel sorry for her, for what happened to her from the time she was 11 or 12 years old. After that, it was all bad. I think she finally, in her mind, thought, now I have something that I never had back then, you know, God. How did you feel after she was executed? Terrible. Uh, she wanted me to come, and I said no. You know, but if people ask me, I'll uh, I tell them, yeah, I'm, it's not something I'm proud of, you know. I was proud of every case I worked, <laughs> if it was successful. Uh, but. I don't look at this one with, uh, with any pride. There's, there's no happiness in this case anywhere. Well, 
I'm as hard as it was, I'm, I'm glad you came and I really appreciate it. It's always good seeing you and I, I always appreciate your time. So thank you, you for coming in right. and doing this. You bet. All right. That's it for this episode of The Evidence Room. You can catch us every Wednesday streaming exclusively on KPRC 2 Plus at 6.30. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode.